stuff than you should be able to. my office but a storeroom essentially so yeah. but it looks very nice
Welcome to our panel discussion, revisiting George Washington's assault on the Haudenosaunee 240 years later. Um, my name is Phil Arnold. I'm the chair of the religion department at Syracuse University and founding director of the Scano Great Law Peace Center. Um, I have to wear this SU hat because uh, we're headed into a football game. So that's my obligation today. But we have a great lineup for you today. Um, but I wanted to first uh, thank um, Adam Brett and Sarah Shute, who are running the tech for us today. Uh, this is all an experiment for all of us, so um, please bear with us if there's some uh, technical issues. Um, but it's great to be with you today, and thanks for coming. Um, let me share a screen. In a PowerPoint. All right. So I wanted to mention that um, this assault on the Haudenosaunee, which is called the Sullivan Clinton campaign, is a far ranging topic. And we're just going to touch on a few details today. But it's um, critical for understanding the relationship between the United States and Native American or Indigenous peoples of the Americas. Um, just years before 1779, just a decade before, founding fathers were sitting in council with the Haudenosaunee, learning about the great law of peace in order to form American democracy. And then after 1779, there was this attack on the Haudenosaunee and everything changed. So moving from the colonial period to the American period, is what defines um, these relationships. And so it is not just to help us understand the Haudenosaunee, but American history better and our relationship with indigenous peoples. Uh, we have excellent presenters today. Um, Alyssa Mount Pleasant from the University of Buffalo and Transnational Studies. Alyssa is going to talk to us on a wide range of issues. Um, historical issues, uh, Buff Buffalo Creek and other things, uh, we're, we're really grateful to have her with us today. Jake Edwards of the Onondaga Nation, who is um, very deeply knowledgeable of not only this event and the history around this event, really the oral history of this event, but also deeply knowledgeable of the language and cultural traditions of the Haudenosaunee. And Andrea Smith from Lafayette College, uh, who is going to introduce us to the, you know, kind of constant resistance of the Haudenosaunee uh, to these, to a kind of false memory uh, around the Sullivan Clinton campaign. Our sponsors today are the Syracuse Humanities, Syracuse University Humanities Center, uh, Syracuse University Department of Religion, the Scano Great Law Peace Center, and the Indigenous Values Initiative. All right, first, um, I wanna talk about the Scano Great Law Peace Center because I hope all of you will become much more interested in visiting the Scano Center. Um, 
this is a little introduction to myself but as the founding director of the scano center we put a great deal of energy into portraying the haudenosaunee values and particularly the onondaga values at the scano center and i want to describe it a little bit to you so in 1656 to 1658 just 20 short months the the jesuits founded a fortified mission or fort at onondaga lake and they were representing the french colonial government in montreal that granted them title to onondaga lake and the territory before they came really about 600 square miles around onondaga lake so this legacy has been celebrated at onondaga lake with the french fort first in 1933 and then later with saint marie among the iroquois which has expanded into what's called the living museum that celebrated this colonial history that went out of business in 2011 and then um, we took over uh, to repurpose saint marie among the iroquois into the scano great love peace center and that now tells the story of the founding of the Haudenosaunee thousands of years ago at Onondaga Lake and to bring back the presence of the, of the Haudenosaunee there to Onondaga Lake. So now we tell a very different story than the colonial one. The Scano Center originated with this collaborative, this wide ranging collaborative. The Scano Center is a county, Onondaga County facility. It's managed by Onondaga Historical Association, but the narrative was crafted by a variety of academics uh, from these different colleges, universities in our area and foundations. And this all enabled us to have the uh, strong message from the Onondaga Nation, which is the central fire of the Haudenosaunee there at the Scano Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Haudenosaunee, it means people of the longhouse. Their colonized name is the Iroquois, which is largely considered a, a negative term, a pejorative term. Originally, five nations were founded as a confederacy at Onondaga Lake. Um, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Tuscarora, and Seneca, the Tuscarora joined later. But the influences of the Haudenosaunee ranged very far from Nova Scotia to the Mississippi River uh, Valley from the Great Lakes into Georgia. So they were well known and a very powerful influence all through the colonial period. Today, Onondaga Nation, the territory we're currently in, is among the last sovereign nations that are, that are run by their traditional governments or pre-American governments. And the great law of peace is one of those elements that inspired Western democracy, the women's movement, lacrosse, and a variety of other things. You can learn about this all at the Scano Center. So at Onondaga Lake, right near Syracuse, New York, we have this very important body of water that is uh, culturally distinctive for its founding of the Great Law of Peace. You know, recent archeological ex excavations put it at 909 CE is probably much earlier than that. that so this, in, you know, very important narrative, the first contact with Jesuit missionaries, and we do still have the Jesuit fort. There's a photo of it there. And then also a stop along the Erie Canal. And also it had a direct involvement in the Sullivan Clinton campaign, which we'll try to describe today. So um, at the Scano Center, we take a values approach. Um, this uh, describes the six different video stops, uh, content stops, uh, through the Scano Center. And it, and it really describes the oral history of the Haudenosaunee. Um, I'll just uh, mention that it's not until the fifth video that we get to European contact. So we're really trying to introduce people to the Haudenosaunee value system in a kind of a, in a very abbreviated way. Um, and then 
uh, leading up to contact, you'll notice that Sullivan Clinton campaign is one of those elements. So what is the Sullivan Clinton campaign? Um, it was a US attack on the Haudenosaunee that for some reason, it's not showing up here on my, but it's from April to October of 1779, all right? And this map describes the route of the Sullivan Clinton campaign, which is often described as starting in late summer that comes right up the Susquehanna River into Cayuga ter territory first and then Seneca territory. But also earlier that year, Onondaga was attacked through uh, Fort Stanwix up here. And that's often neglected in the story of the Sullivan Clinton campaign. So I wanna emphasize that in my talk. Sullivan, uh, George Washington wrote to Major General John Sullivan, uh, 31 May, 1779, the expedition you are appointed to command is to be directed against the hostile tribes of the Six Nations of Indians, i.e. the Haudenosaunee, with their associates and adherents. The immediate objects are total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every sex and age as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops in the ground and prevent their planting more. Okay, so what this describes is a scorched earth campaign by Washington directing John Sullivan. Now, um, they were dedicating about a million dollars in, in money of that period. And this is highly unusual because the Cong Congressional Congress at this time was broke. Um, and so they're right in the middle of the Re Revolutionary War against England, but they suspend the Revolutionary War to attack the Haudenosaunee. Now, one of the questions is why? Now, quite the opposite then the, then they're being hostile to the patriots um there was an agreed on neutrality agreement between the grand council of chiefs and the patriots just a few years earlier so really what's happening here with the with washington's decision is to open up the continent for white settlement the dispossession of Haudenosaunee people and other indigenous people and then paying the patriots for land Remember, upstate New York has the most rich agricultural land in probably the, the world. So this is very highly coveted land, uh, which you can learn about um, through the work of Jane Mount Pleasant and others at Cornell University. All right, all right. So the consequences of the Sullivan campaign, this plaque, by the way, is, um, in Nedro, New York, um, and also appears at the Scano Center. Uh, this laid waste, uh, laid the land to waste. It's like I said, scorched earth. Uh, 250,000 bushels of corn were destroyed, were scorched, and uh, this is commemorated in some of the foodways of the Seneca in particular. Um, 43 Haudenosaunee towns were burned. Uh, and also the winter of 1779-80 was very hard. There was starvation and homelessness. And as a result of this, the Haudenosaunee referred to Washington and also the office of the president from that moment to today as Hanadagaius, the destroyer of villages. This is a map of central New York after the Sullivan Clinton campaign. This is a bit later. Uh, map drawn uh, by Simon DeWitt, uh, which describes what's called the, the military tracks, which came as a result of uh, the Sullivan Clinton campaign. You'll notice here the Onondaga Reservation, as it's called, Onondaga Castle completely surrounds, it's really Syracuse, and surrounds Onondaga Lake, Cayuga Reservation, which is uh, also disputed territory is also mentioned here. And you'll notice Tully, Fabius, Marcellus, Manlius, Camillus, Cicero, all kind of uh, Greco-Roman military leaders. Uh, and, and there is this emphasis on 
military occupation, which I want to mention later. Okay, so I want to thank here uh, Bob Spiegelman, Robert Spiegelman, who wasn't able to join us today, unfortunately, but Rob, uh, Bob has dedicated his life, he's a sociologist, dedicated his life to help us understand the Sullivan-Clinton campaign as a major moment in American identity, in American history. And he has created this site, the Sullivan Clinton Campaign. We want to introduce this site to you because uh, we have helped Bob restore the site, which was on kind of shaky ground. Adam has put a lot of time into this. And a lot of the content here, we have maps and galleries and texts. In 1879, there was a big celebration of the Sullivan Clinton Campaign, which republished, republished a lot of these founding documents. So a lot of that is on. We want to also invite you. I know there are many people that are working on this uh, topic as well. We want to invite you to um, participate in growing this site to make it more of a, a distribution hub for those of us who want to introduce our students to these to this topic and this important information. Okay. So the the thing about the Sullivan Clinton campaign is that it it was specifically geared to try to break the back of the Haudenosaunee. What we'll discover though, is that it actually did not. And um, uh, Alyssa's work goes particularly to that, to that uh, topic. And what we know, some of what we know about the, uh, about the uh, event comes from the uh, journals of this foot soldiers that were in Sullivan's uh, attack force. And I want to read one of those to you in a bit. But first, I want to emphasize this point because I'm a historian of religions and I'm not strictly speaking a historian. I don't just talk about texts. I'm also interested in the oral history and what other resources we can count on to think about American identity and our relationship with the indigenous peoples here. So, what really is stark to me is the Sullivan Clinton campaign defines a kind of settler colonial relationship to the land, and that has to do with a military style occupation. And that is one of the consequences of the Sullivan Clinton campaign that I think is most profoundly important in these days of climate change. So I'm going to talk about something else that happens just before um, Washington's letter to Sullivan. It's called the Van Schaik attack on the Onondaga nation, which happened on the 21st of April, the spring of 1779, just before Sullivan Clinton. Um, lieutenant Beatty's uh, part, uh, he's, a, he's a, a lieutenant in the in Van Schaik's arm, army, and he uh, has a surviving journal of the attack and I will just show it to you, it's here in this, uh, in this uh, link, but um, what he describes on the 21st, uh, the morning of the 21st is him, them going across the, uh, wading across Onondaga Lake and Onondaga Creek, taking people prisoners. Um, one guy's out hunting, another person, another woman is out with her children and two women and one of them is killed. Uh, there's, there's a white, white man, man. there's um, also a, a Negro, as they say, who is their doctor. There's lots of very interesting tidbits here, but also it's kind of describes the, the kind of banality of genocide here, um, that, that they're, they're marching on Onondaga. They're attempting to destroy Onondaga, which is the central fire. They know this. And they're, they're um, and what he describes is um, at the end, we killed about 15, took 34 prisoners, burned about 30 or 40 houses. And these houses are enormous, multi-family houses, but not one of their men was killed. So I just wanted to um, demonstrate for you how these, these, uh, these diaries can be valuable, but also they lie, right? They don't give you the whole story. So how do we get the whole story? And that's one of the questions, kind of the methodological questions 
we're working with here. So he launches his attack from Fort Stanwix. This is some artist rendering of the Sullivan Clinton campaign, how they destroyed all of these towns. And then on their way out from the attack at Onondaga on the 22nd of April, 1779, there are these plaques where they camp on an island. He mentions that in his diary. You know, so there are all these plaques, which Andrea will be telling us about too. Fort Brewerton was one of kind of the westward fort fortified places where they also stopped along the route back to Fort Stanwix. Then there's this tortured history that used to appear in Onondaga Park here located in Syracuse. And I'll just read it. Indian attack on Colonel Van Schoik's expedition against the Onondaga, April 21, 1779, put up in 1930. Now I want you to take a minute and think about this. What they're celebrating, what they're commemorating is the Indian attack against the Colonel that had attacked the Onondagas. All right. So there's this kind of tortured memory here, which we're trying to correct in many ways. So the Onondaga are burned out of their home. And when they return, they hear a voice in the woods. Okay, remember, everything is gone, all their food stores. The winter of 1780 is the worst in memory. It's cold, people are starving and freezing. And what they hear in the woods is the 17 year locust. And according to the Onondaga, this is the first appearance of the locust, which they regard as a gift of the creator. And the Onondaga people are the only people of the Haudenosaunee to eat these locusts. But what they do when they eat the locust every 17 years is tell the story of the Sullivan Clinton campaign to their children. So this is history. This is oral history. And this is the 17 year locust in 2018 was their last appearance. And in history of religions, we refer to these manifestations of the sacred as hierophanies, as manifestations of the sacred. So the 17 year locust, this isn't biblical locust, which is a plague and all that, right? This is a gift from the creator. And in 2018, we had the opportunity to, to uh, eat the locust. I want to talk, show you a very brief film if I can indulge my panelists here. And, um, but first I wanted just to mention our organization, uh, nonprofit organization, Indigenous Values Initiative. Please go and email us if you have any comments, questions, or interest in uh, pursuing this topic. But I want to just go to quickly this, this video, which I've never shown before. Uh, this is where, this is the Tadadaho, Sid Hill, um, just having eaten some locust. And it's important to eat the locust every 17 years and retell the story. And here he talks about the Sullivan Clinton campaign. And I'm just gonna play a few minutes of this.
Okay, I understand that you can't hear Tadadaho. So I will not show this video, but trust me, he talks about how the devastation impacted the Onondaga and how the Onondaga were blessed with the coming of the locust. Thanks very much, everyone. So next, I would like to introduce Alyssa Mount Pleasant, and she'll talk to us about Buffalo Creek. My name is Alyssa Mount Pleasant. I'm a faculty member at the University at Buffalo. I am also a Tuscarora descendant on my father's side. I am coming, I'm joining this conversation from Buffalo, New York, in the traditional homelands of the Seneca Nation. I'm very glad to be able to talk about the Sullivan campaign and particularly the period following the Sullivan campaign, which is part of my ongoing research over, uh, over many years now. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I will launch now. So if, if anyone would like to be in touch with me, I have shared my email address on this opening slide. My conversation today and our larger conversation is really discussing an unprecedented invasion of uh, Haudenosaunee territory. Uh, while Professor, um, uh, <clears throat> while, um, <clears throat> while the previous presentation has emphasized the very short-lived um, experience of Jesuits in and around Onondaga Lake, um, other than another in invasion in the late 17th century, the Haudenosaunee territories in um, what is currently central and uh, western New York were very infrequently visited by um, Euro, uh, Europeans and Euro-Americans the, during the 8th, 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and so the Sullivan campaign was really a, a, a new expedition, a, a new um, phenomenon, bringing Americans into the region um, for the very first, uh, for the very first time in many cases. What I'd like to, the place where I'd like to start is uh, with um, an image as well as a, um, a narrative, a vignette of, of 1779. When you travel, um, when you dri drive through back roads of New York State um, in the current day, you will often see these um, blue and gold markers uh, along the sides of the roads um, indicating sites or, um, uh, or moments in the Sullivan campaign. And um, Andrea Smith will talk a bit about this more in a little bit. I also have a project documenting these roadside markers. And this is a, an image that I took outside of what is currently Geneva, New York. Um, and um, as we are looking at this image, I wanna share with you um, a narrative that I've created, a vignette, uh, about 1779 to take us back to that moment. The morning air was cool and crisp on a mid-September day in 1779. A light frost blanketed the ground at the Seneca village of Geneseo. As the sun crept over the horizon, a woman stirred on a sleeping berth in a crowded longhouse. Careful not to disturb those beside her, she slid out of bed. Within moments, she located her calico shift and skirt, smoothed her hair, and slipped into a pair of well-worn moccasins. Dressed for the day, she tiptoed carefully past the smoldering embers on the central hearth and made her way out of the building, stepping into the early morning sun. A rumble in her stomach reminded the woman it was time to start the morning meal. Walking toward the cooking lean-to, her feet crunched on the frosty ground. At the, at the cooking pit, she found a few red embers from the previous night's fire, raked them together, and set about rebuilding. 
Luckily, the sky had been clear the night before and the dry wood soon crackled. She placed a few large logs on the fire and stood up, dusting off her hands. A chipmunk scampered past the garbage heap near the clearing's edge. Moments later, her daughter peeked out from the vestibule, blinking as her eyes adjusted to the morning sun. The woman spoke softly and her daughter rushed over. It was the girl's job to fetch water, so she grabbed two wooden buckets and headed off along the path toward the river. The woman watched her daughter go, then turned to a basket of parched corn among the supplies in the lean-to. She set the basket next to a substantial hollowed out stump that served as a mortar, quickly brushed a few stray leaves out of the bowl and dumped in several uh, scoops of kernels. The long carved maple branch she used as a pestle felt familiar in her hands, though it was not her own. All of her cooking tools were far away, left behind when her family fled their home in Chicago the previous month. As the woman worked the corn into a rough meal, she wondered how long they would spend at Geneseo. The village was impressive, with over 100 longhouses and extraordinary agricultural fields. It was located on a beautiful uh, flat above the river, but it wasn't home. During the late summer of 1779, Haudenosaunee people fled their homes in the Finger Lakes region of today's New York State. That miserable season, American forces led by General John Sullivan invaded the Haudenosaunee homelands, laying waste to over 40 towns and villages, destroying thousands of acres of agricultural fields and felling, and felling orchards throughout the region. Four brigades of army regulars and militia members, numbering nearly 4,000 soldiers, spent weeks trekking up the Susquehanna River through the rolling terrain of the Cayuga and Seneca nations, wreaking havoc as they went. Simultaneous expeditions led by Colonel Daniel Broadhead and General James Sullivan followed other routes through the region, cutting a broad swath of destruction. As the large army slowly made its way towards major settlements, scouts alerted residents of their impending danger. Um, many people uh, whose, path, whose villages lay in the path of destruction were warned in advance of the attack and were able to flee. Um, overmatched, they fled Amer as advancing American troops reached their homes, abandoning their dwellings, their food stores, and their crops that were on the verge of, of harvest. Following paths that, along lake shores and over ridges, women and, ch and children uh, and those elders who were able to travel made their way west. They stopped over in towns uh, that had not yet experienced the wrath of the Continental Army soldiers and American militia members. As American forces approached the Genesee River and the extraordinary agricultural communities at places like Geneseo, yet again, people gathered what they could carry and fled further west. Nearly 20 years later, the Seneca leader farmer's brother would compare this period with a whirlwind that visited massive destruction. In, uh, in, in his, as his words were translated, this whirlwind tore up the trees and tossed to and fro the leaves so that no one knows from whence they came or where they would fall. Today, I want to talk a little bit about what happened after that whirlwind subsided. Um, one of the things that I argue and I think is really important to underline is that Haudenosaunee people did reestablish themselves following the events of the Sullivan campaign. As uh, Professor Arnold has indicated, that meant subsisting on, on locusts, right, which provided critical food. And I'll talk about some other strategies as well further west. Yeah. Additionally, I'm going to talk a bit about Buffalo Creek which was a new cosmopolitan community that was formed in the midst of this war, uh, where people drew on sophisticated traditions and practices uh, as they built new homes and resumed familiar subsistence patterns. Um, I wanna talk about the contours of this community as it took shape in the 1780s. And I also wanna talk a bit about the motivations for selecting Buffalo Creek as the site for the largest community, Haudenosaunee community south of the Great Lakes. Um, but before I move on to that discussion um, about what happened after the whirlwind, 
I need to provide some more details about the events immediately following the Sullivan campaign. Um, as we've discussed, um, houses, villages, agricultural fields were all destroyed and many, many people fled, uh, fled west. Um, they found their way to Fort Niagara where they hoped that their British allies would be able to provide some sort of refuge um, at, this, uh, at this military installation located um, along Lake, Ni uh, Lake Ontario near the mouth of the Niagara River. Unfortunately, British officials were not prepared to receive them. The fort was already harboring hundreds of loyalist ref refugees who had fled um, colonial settlements in the Mohawk Valley and other places. And tents, and as a result, tents and provisions were in short supply. Native people were forced to construct makeshift camps along the fort's perimeter. And as the brutally cold winter progressed, Lake Ontario froze and any hope of resupply of additional provisions uh, quickly evaporated. The historian Colin Calloway has explained that British troops, loyalists, and native peoples experienced tremendous suffering during the winter of 1779 to 1780, which was one of the coldest winters on record. Um, for those of uh, this, uh, the picture that I have um, here on this slide was taken in the winter of 2014, which was um, a, which has been referred to as a polar vortex winter. And when I try to explain and uh, help people imagine the conditions um, in the winter of 1779, I think we can, you know, we can perhaps refer to experiences that we had um, more relatively recently during that polar vortex winter. In 1779, the snow fell so deeply that it was impossible for animals to make their way through and they died in their tracks. Um, and, um, and people uh, at, at Fort Niagara and in other places where they found refuge died of exposure. They died of starvation. They died of diseases that, um, that run rampant when there are poor sanitary conditions. And so when the weather started to warm up, when the ice started to thaw, um, Haudenosaunee people were desperate to relocate and, um, and many um, survivors of the Sullivan campaign who were encamped around Fort Niagara um, started to move away from that site. And they found their way to a place that we now know as Buffalo Creek. And Buffalo Creek is a place that was known in stories and traditions of Haudenosaunee people um, and also um, people who had been adopted into Haudenosaunee communities uh, during, the 17th, uh, during the 17th century. Um, stories about Buffalo Creek discuss it as a place where people could find good health and um, well-being. And um, so uh, in the early spring of 1780, people uh, started to move away. Now, this image on the um, right-hand side of the screen is an image of Buffalo Creek that I took in the summer of, of 2014. Um, Buffalo Creek is located along the southern shore of Lake Erie. And the creek and its tributaries are well situated um, near the edge of what is today's Buffalo, city of Buffalo, New York. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the area was heavily wooded with deciduous forests of ash trees, bass trees, beech, chestnut, hickory, hemlock, maple, and oak trees, along with occasional stands of pine trees. And this dense forest was home to species, uh, numerous species of birds and animals. The waterways supported many, many species of fish. Um, refugees from the Sullivan campaign drew on these abundant resources as they established a new cosmopolitan community along the creek and its tributaries. Uh, beginning in the spring 1780, people built new homes and cleared and cultivated fields along Buffalo Creek. 
where they resumed familiar social, political, and economic practices. They built villages uh, along this waterway, and by 1781, over 1,400 people called Buffalo Creek their home. This Buffalo Creek quickly became the largest Haudenosaunee community south of the Great Lakes, and it was a site where prominent leaders settled. It also served as a new political center. Residents of this community relied on Haudenosaunee traditions, including cultural uh, sub, uh, subsistence patterns, diplomatic protocols, and social and political practices that, were embed that are embedded in foundational traditions, such as the great law of peace. Um, this is um, some of the details about uh, life at Buffalo Creek are embedded in oral traditions. Other details about life at Buffalo Creek can be found in um, records created by colonial actors. And so this is a, um, uh, this is a glimpse of the de demography at Buffalo Creek in the spring of 1781, and it comes from uh, British records uh, in the papers of Sir Frederick Haldeman. Um, British Indian, British in Indian Department officials um, as, uh, visited Buffalo Creek uh, many times, traveling over from Fort Niagara, and also Haudenosaunee people traveled to Fort Niagara from from Buffalo Creek and other uh, and other Haudenosaunee settlements uh, throughout western, uh, throughout the western part of their territory. Um, this, these records can help us to understand some of the contours of life at Buffalo Creek in the immediate aftermath of the Sullivan campaign. And um, during a visit in the in June of 1780, so very shortly after the initial move to Buffalo Creek, a British official named Colonel Guy Johnson reported that there were over 400 people who had settled in the area. And he, he noted that more, would, more people would have moved along with them if he had been able to provide enough um, seed corn and also enough hoes for women to cultivate um, corn and begin their resume their agricultural practices at Buffalo Creek. Additionally, um, during this period in the early 1780s, there was a woman named Rebecca, a young woman named Rebecca Gilbert, who was taken in um, to Sangaragatha or Old Smoke's extended family um, during raids that followed the Sullivan campaign. And she developed a captivity narrative that um, recorded some of her experiences while living at Buffalo Creek in the early 1780s. She was part of um, planting groups with, um, with other women uh, during that time. And she traveled to sugar bushes and pigeon nesting sites. She gathered hickory nuts and worked alongside other women planting. And they also traveled to Fort Niagara and Fort Erie to exchange furs for supplies and provisions during this time. And her captivity narrative helps us to understand that Haudenosaunee people immediately resumed familiar subsistence practices, cultivating the sustainers, corn, beans, and squash, and following their, the seasonal round of hunting, fishing, gathering, and planting. Uh, we also can understand from, from this narrative that Haudenosaunee people were incorporating the British Indian Department resources right, into their seasonal round right, of um, subsistence strategies. Right? So, and alongside her adoptive family, Rebecca Gilbert sought support from the British outpost in the spring, right, at a time when um, people were waiting for their crops. Uh, to mature. These Indian Department statistics that are, uh, that are pictured here and other statistics that are found in the documentary record also help us to understand the steady development of new communities and Native people's seasonal reliance on their British allies. Um, according to census material in the Haldeman papers, uh, other, other materials, from the spring of 1780 to the fall of that year, the number of Native people residing in settlements that they were rebuilding, which includes Buffalo Creek and other villages, increased to, to nearly 2,500 people. 
And that population continued to grow, right, throughout the late fall and into, into the winter. Um, in the early spring of 1781, um, when game was scarce and supplies were depleted, more people turned to the British outposts, right? But again, as soon as the, uh, the sap started to run, the ice started to break up and people could move back into their villages, um, that's what they did. Um, by um, mid-May of 1781, as, this, um, as the statistics here show, nearly 1,500 people were living at Buffalo Creek alone. Uh, and, um, and the refugee population at, um, at Fort Niagara had reduced to just 25% of what it was by the end of that summer. Now, why do I underline this? Um, one of the things, one of the stories that um, scholars, that historians of um, early America and of, Hod of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois history have argued um, for many years is that Haudenosaunee people um, experienced dependency following the Sullivan campaign. And this, as this snapshot and other stories that we can tell um, about this period show, um, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, Haudenosaunee people were moving as quickly as they could to reestablish their communities and to continue to pursue their own goals in um, defending their communities, defending their territories, and um, maintaining uh, their sovereignty during this period of tremendous upheaval in the eastern part of North America. And um, in the years in the years that followed at Buffalo Creek, uh, people continued uh, <clears throat> to um, this multinational community this cosmopolitan community continued to pursue um, war, diplomacy, and peace, can remain active um, in raiding and, um, and military exploits, despite the efforts of the um, Continental Army to destroy the, um, the home front, uh, the Haudenosaunee home front. This is an image, uh, well, there's two images here, one image on the, on the right, is of um, a, a gentleman that in English is referred to as Captain Hold, who was uh, a leader within the, an Onondaga leader within the Confederacy. And then on the left-hand side is a, an artist's representation of the council that was held at Buffalo Creek around 1793. Um, Haudenosaunee people convened numerous meetings at Buffalo Creek. Um, in, in their efforts to cultivate and maintain diplomatic relationships with um, Native and non-Native people whose territories um, uh, were adjacent or adjacent to their own. And um, between 1780, uh, 1784 and 1794, Haudenosaunee people were were incredibly active at Buffalo Creek, at Philadelphia, at Albany and other places, uh, negotiating with Americans to establish a, a meaningful peace following the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. And um, this involved, um, these efforts concluded in 1794 at um, Canon uh, which is a town uh, on, um, on Seneca Lake. Uh, these efforts invoke the Treaty of Canandaigua, which remains in place to this day, established peace and friendship with the Haudenosaunee and her Six Nations and the United States. It reiterated nation-to-nation -nation relationships between the Six Nations and uh, the United States and it guaranteed the territory, uh, the territorial integrity of the, um, of the, of the Six Nations, and particular, particularly the, the Seneca Nation. It was signed at Canandaigua in 1794. Over 1,600 people from um, Haudenosaunee communities traveled to Canandaigua to participate in this, um, in this lengthy negotiation 
and which was the result of many, many years of diplomatic uh, work on the part of Haudenosaunee people who were who undertook the really challenging process of um, helping Americans to understand the practices and protocols of Haudenosaunee diplomacy. Um, was ratified by the Senate in 1795, and as I've mentioned, it is a um, uh, it, it is a treaty that remains in place today. Next month, next month on November 11th, there will be a commemoration at Canandaigua, uh, as there is every year of this incredibly important agreement. Um, for Haudenosaunee people and for, for Seneca people in particular, this um, the guarantees of the Treaty of Canandaigua in terms of territorial integrity right, were very quickly challenged. And within three years, uh, Americans gathered um, with, some, with some Haudenosaunee people at, um, at, at Big Tree um, along the Genesee River to enact a treaty um, in the fall of 1797. This is a treaty that um, resulted in the loss of uh, vast amounts of territory west of the Genesee River. And it was a treaty that reflected um, the interests of a man named Robert Morris, who was a major, um, who was a critical uh, financier of the American side of, of the revolution. He was in dire financial straits and, at that time and really desperate to um, create conditions where his, um, his claims to um, preemption of um, Haudenosaunee territories um, in the western part of what is currently New York State would allow him to recoup some of his uh, and, and restore his financial condition. Um, this is in the center there. Uh, on the left hand side of this slide, there is a um, statue of Robert Morris it's in Philadelphia near Independence Hall, marking his prominence in early American history. And uh, in the center, there's another roadside marker um, that can be found on the campus of SUNY Geneseo. And finally, there's a map indicating um, reservation territories that were um, reserved during the 1797 Treaty of, um, uh, of Big Tree. Um, circling back to Buffalo Creek, Buffalo Creek was one of the reservation territories that was created um, during the Treaty of, uh, through the Treaty of um, Big Tree. And this is a much later map of Buffalo, uh, of Buffalo Creek. It dates to about 1845. It marks off the reservation as, it, as land speculators were preparing to sell the territory. I don't have time to get into it right now, but there were two um, treaties in 1838 and 1842 that resulted in the loss of the Buffalo Creek Reservation. Um, Following the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825, Buffalo Creek um, was um, highly sought after as a location for the city of the city of Buffalo hoped to be able to expand into. And so there was a fraudulent treaty in 1848 and a, a compromise treaty in 1842. Um, together, those two treaties resulted in the loss of Buffalo Creek. The 1842 treaty did allow um, for Seneca people to retain um, other, their other reservation territories. The last thing that I want to talk about um, at Buffalo Creek is the ways in which Haudenosaunee people during the 19th century um, worked uh, to maintain their territory while selectively engaging with colonists. Um, and by colonists here, I mean Americans. Right? I mean, US, US citizens who were moving into the region and sending missionaries uh, into to Buff the, the Buffalo Creek and reservations um, throughout uh, all along the Eastern seaboard. Uh, at Buffalo Creek, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time um, studying is the ways in which Native, uh, Native people spent over a decade um, debating amongst themselves about the appropriate place for formal schooling 
uh, in their communities. Eventually, that eventually led to a decision within the community to allow some missionaries to establish a school where they would teach um, reading, writing, and uh, arithmetic. Uh, Haudenosaunee people at Buffalo Creek, which included Senecas, Cayugas, Onondagas, and members of other communities who made their homes there, um, were highly suspicious of the work of missionaries. And at the same time, as more and more Americans moved into um, and established adjacent communities, they recognized that um, these were skill sets that they needed to have and they negotiated as carefully as they possibly could with the missionaries um, about the establishment of schools in their, um, in their regions, in their, in their reservation community. Uh, this is a much bigger topic um, that um, that we all would be happy to talk that I would be happy to talk about further. Um, but it is it is one I argue that in my larger work that this is one of the strategies um, that Haudenosaunee people use alongside various other diplomatic strategies um, to work to maintain Buffalo Creek as a Haudenosaunee place in the midst of um, expanding U.S. settler. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mount Pleasant. Next, we'll hear from Andrea Smith, Professor Andrea Smith, um, who will be talking about um, the 19th, uh, 20th century and the signage around the Sullivan Clinton campaign. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for including me, Yahweh. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank Scano and the Syracuse University and everybody here for putting together such an interesting panel and for inviting me to participate. Um, right now, I'm, I'm a professor of anthropology at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania. And my contact information is at the bottom of your screen there. Um, I also wanted to say that I'm speaking from New Jersey, uh, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape. So I am today gonna be talking about a piece of some research that's looking at how the Sullivan Clinton expedition has been commemorated. I want to start by saying a little bit about myself though first. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist who looks at memory and forgetting and I'm especially interested in the role of the past in helping to legitimize dominant groups um, and that help them hold on to their power. So my first study was actually with French settlers of Algeria and I was interested in how people who fled the colony at decolonization in the 60s looked back at the colonial past and how they um, reframed it for their own interests in the present. And so I'm now working on a new project that's looking at a similar topic. It's how um, Euro-Americans have been commemorating a piece of their history, the Sullivan Expedition, what is called the Sullivan Expedition in Pennsylvania, what's called the Sullivan Clinton Campaign in New York. And I'm interested in why people commemorated it, how they've commemorated it, and what kind of stories they're telling themselves by commemorating it. Um, by, and I'm interested in how Euro-Americans place markers on the land that tell a certain story and how in doing so they're also hiding other stories. So, what I'm going to work on today is basically the 1929 um, stone markers that people can see across central New York. There are about 35 that have been established. They were followed by the, the gold and the blue signs that um, Dr. Mount Pleasant just mentioned um, that were established in the 30s. And so I'm interested in, in asking who set up these markers in New York and why, and what was the motivation um, so most of these markers were established during a sesquicentennial celebration. I want to just give you an overview to tell you where we're headed here. Um, so I'm looking at how Sullivan Clinton is kind of invented 
It's invented as something to commemorate at a certain time. And, you know, you might say, well, at the time, people were crazy about the Revolutionary War. This was an anniversary. Maybe New Yorkers were especially patriotic, or maybe something else is going on. The other point that I want to bring up is I'll be looking at how state officials try to invite Haudenosaunee to participate in their festivities and their parades and their marker dedications and the pageant, but are rejected. Why? And what I'll be saying is that there's an interesting coincidence of two things going on at once that I think are related. So one is the invention of the Sullivan Clinton tradition. And the other is a, a stretch of Haudenosaunee activism that really picks up into a land claims movement that is threatening um, sovereignty in a lot of New York state. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the relationship of these two things. So the 1929 festivities were part of New York's um, celebration of the Revolutionary War. And New York was not alone. As um, cities and states started to approach, you know, the signing of the declaration, the, two, the 150th anniversary, they had huge events. So for instance, in Philly, there was a huge programming, other states had programming. And so in New York, people started thinking about this in the 20s, early 20s. This program was placed under the education department and it was directed by a man named Alexander Flick, who was the state historian. So you're gonna hear a lot about Flick now. Um, he chaired a committee that first tried to decide what events to celebrate for New York's Revolutionary War um, uh, sesquicentennial. So they sent out surveys and they, surveys came back with 640 different events people thought should be celebrated. And they set about putting together pageants around the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the creation of the New York Constitution, the Battle of Long Island, and so forth. Among these 640 events, Sullivan and Clinton barely featured. It was not really a focus. And they even put together a big book about the Revolutionary War in New York. And it's only mentioned in a couple lines in that whole book. So Sullivan, the Sullivan expedition is not a focus at first until they run out of funding at the end of 1927. And so at this point, Flick proposes to the state to get more money to carry out a celebration of Sullivan and Clinton. And he argued that the Sullivan and Clinton was attractive to celebrate because it covered so much ground. It, included 20 or more counties. And so you could have more area in which to engage in public history making. Um, and at the time people thought that engaging children in this kind of public history making around the Revolutionary War would turn them into better citizens and so forth. And so he gave speeches across the state to kind of bring people up to speed. And when you read the speeches, you can see he's taking a defensive position because for many, um, Non-native New Yorkers, Sullivan was still a, a kind of distasteful, there was kind of a distasteful um, feeling about what the soldiers had done. And we've heard a, a great deal with the previous presentations about exactly what this involved. Um, so Flick is, is countering this kind of distaste and he's trying to drum up support. Ooh, this slide got messed up. But anyway, what, um, what this slide is telling us is that his first task was to kind of rebrand it. So he invents something called the Sullivan Clinton campaign. He writes in some of his materials that this was part of Washington's Indian expedition. And the Indian expedition was then renamed as the Sullivan expedition. And that was the name that it was known for, for a long time. He says in his um, statement to the board, Board of Regents and so forth, that it should be called the Sullivan Clinton campaign, campaign, not expedition, because it was larger. And he thought that we should include Clinton because he was second in command. What is interesting is that Clinton was one of several generals of the same status from different states. And so that's what's in the tiny little letters here. Um, Maxwell was leading a brigade from New Jersey. Poor was leading a brave brigade from New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and Han was leading a brigade from Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see already by calling this Sullivan Clinton campaign, they're bringing in Clinton, you know, part of um, sort of New York royalty, so to speak. 
and dismissing the participation of generals from other states. So it kind of constructs this as a more New York focused element of the Revolutionary War. And you can even see this in, depicted in some of the plaques. So Pennsylvania also put up uh, sesquicentennial plaques, but they call it the Sullivan Expedition. Okay. But even with this new name, it's unclear what you're gonna celebrate. You know, what are you going to um, celebrate what was really wanton destruction that would be probably labeled genocidal today? So early news stories um, show how he wasn't really sure what to do. So one of the first ideas was to have people march around the state um, <laughs> exactly where the troops had gone, which for many people would have been seen as very threatening. And then they quickly calculated this would take way too long. And then they thought about buses and having busing troops around. And then he thought that would mar the effect. Um, when he spoke to the Livingston County Historical Society, he said it, the celebration was not going to be for the commemoration of a military victory, but more for its significance afterwards. He said he didn't want to celebrate destruction, but he wanted to see an Indian village built with two models of Indian homes, growing crops, and even domestic animals, if they should be found practical. Um, he made a pitch for the people of Elmira that they were gonna have an all out reenactment of the Battle of Newtown. And he said that local Indians were gonna play a role in his language, he, this is what he said. The battle will be enacted in full costume and arrangements are now being made with the Iroquois Indians on the state reservations to take part, representing their forefathers who fought under Joseph Grant. Um, in the end, several of these plans never transpired. And what he ended up doing was mostly organizing a series of historical marker dedications <clears throat> with local communities bearing half the cost. And you can see there was also a big pageant. Um, so the local, the marker dedications, here's a dedication of a marker in Elmira in 1929. And then they have this massive pageant that's put on in three different locations in September of 1929. But what I want to talk about now is how his, um, one of his elements, one of the ways he defended this program was by including Haudenosaunee participants. And so when he first outlined his plans for the Board of Regents, they said, um, the meaning is not to gloat or revive old hatred. And so for that reason, they're quarterly going to invite um, representatives of Canada, Great Britain, and the Iroquois to take part. Um, they don't outline exactly how they're going to take part. And when you, when I go through some of these ideas, you, you can think about how Flick really had a difficulty understanding how this would be um, viewed from a Haudenosaunee perspective. Um, what he did is he reached out to many Haudenosaunee leaders, inviting them. So here's a letter that he um, sent to a Seneca leader saying, we want to establish a beautiful monument. In this case, they wanted to put a monument on the Allegheny, Allegheny territory. Um, would you consent to take part in the ceremony? Um, so he sent out lots of letters like this. And for the most part, people just did not respond. So I just, I think I've given you enough time to take a look at that. So you might say not responding is already an active choice and is a form of resistance. There's something else going on at the time too. And so to really understand that, we have to go back in time a little bit because the early 1920s were this, was this era of incredible activism and especially about a land claims movement. And in fact, if you go back to this time period, you might even see the entire Sullivan Clinton extravaganza is an elaborate colonizer attempt to respond to this activism, right? Okay. So here's headlines. Um, this is when the news kind of first breaks. Is white man's title to more than 6 million acres of one-time Indian land in New York State threatened, 1922? Um, so the activism that I was mentioning, protesting the imposition of citizenship, condemning the conscription of non-citizen Indians in New York in World War I, that sort of thing. Um, so there was a lot going on, but the real challenge was um, a major land claim issue. 
ok this was brought up after the conclusion of a commission so there was a new york commission that was created after u s district court voted to return land to an oneida family in 1920 and they were stating that new york courts couldn't remove the oneidas as they were a federally recognized tribe this case revealed jurisdictional confusion so the new york legislature had created a commission to determine once and for all whether the six nations of new york were under federal or state control so they created a commission and the the man who ends up chairing it is a man named edward um, everett um, edward everett holds hearings at every single um six nation reservation in new york he goes to ontario as well and he is um, schooled by local Haudenosaunee leaders about federal treaties and some of the treaties we just heard from Dr. Mount Pleasant. Um, let me just move ahead. So he especially hears about the Fort Stanwix Treaty, but also um, the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act, which mandates a federal agent, Indian consent, ratification by the Senate, and a presidential signature in order to purchase Indian land, according to the act, in the language of the act and also the Treaty of Canandaigua that we just heard about. And he starts to realize that despite these federal treaties, New York State speculators that we also heard about just now and political leaders made dozens of fraudulent land disposition agreements with distinct um, Haudenosaunee nations. And he concludes that New York State rests on an unstable legal foundation. These conclusions were radical um, he determined that they, um, six nations have title to lands estimated about 6 million acres. And that's the source of that, that headline I mentioned before. When he presents this to the legislature, his other commission members don't sign his report. The report is never disseminated more widely and only one copy remained in the archives and was kind of lost for a while. But he had already released his findings to the Haudenosaunee leaders that he had consulted with earlier. And so Haudenosaunee began traveling to Onondaga where they were gathering to plan a legal strategy and New York presses were noticing. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. Indians claim half of New York. <laughs> okay. Um, other presses say things like the six nations are out on the word paths, not with tomahawks and sharp pointed arrows for the heart of an enemy, but with lawyers and ancient records. The Buffalo Courier announces in 1925, land on which Buffalo is situated is sought by tribes of six Iroquois nations. So it's at this time when the future of much of the state is possibly at stake that the state historian is planning a statewide celebration of Sullivan Clinton. Um, and so what happens here, so I just have this slide here to kind of depict the Everett report, report is released in 1922. Then you have the state um, starting to plan the Revolutionary War ceremonies, the Haudenosaunee are gathering on Mondagua. And they filed their first um, case in 1925. This is going to be the initial of several different land claims cases. And in the first case was against a power company that occupied land that belonged to the Mohawk Nation. Now, right away, the New York State Attorney uh, moved to dismiss the case on the grounds that the Haudenosaunee were now, um, because of the Indian Citizenship Act, um, citizens of the United States, and they were just submitting the case to the wrong courts but there were appeals right away. So then if you take a look at this graph, you can see that when Sullivan and Clinton commemorations are approved, this case is still in appeal. And even when they're contacting Haudenosaunee leaders, asking them to take part, it's unclear where this case is gonna fall. The appeals are only finally exhausted in May, 1929. This is well after the markers are already starting to go up across New York state. Okay, so that's kind of the coincidence and timing that I wanted to get across. I'll go back to our story. So while the appeals are still waiting and we're not sure what's gonna happen with the land, um, the state historian is tired of not hearing back from Haudenosaunee about participating in his various um, marker dedications. So they decide to go meet with a group of Haudenosaunee that are meeting for a totally different purpose in February of 1929. 
And it's at this meeting that they get a great rebuff. So there was incredible, like just outright rejection of participating in these programs. Um, what they did is they attended the meeting of the Cornell Indian Board. So I have to explain this group for a bit. Um, the Cornell Indian Boards were a group of delegates from different Six Nations that would form, um, that would meet every year in February at Cornell to select students for short courses at Cornell. So this is an inter interesting part of um, New York history. This is a part of the agricultural extension program. Okay, so they would meet every year. And this, this is an image I have of 1921 um, gathering and it has prominent Six Nation leaders, um, as you can see. Here are the people that are meeting at Cornell in February 1929. Now there are also some Onondaga there and I, the newspaper articles did not say who they were. Um, so there you have a gathering of prominent people and they're meeting together at um, the, the ending powwow. Basically, it seems that they were kind of broadsided by the state representative who then approaches them at the Powell and says, hey, why don't you join us at our, we want to extend an official invitation to you um, to participate in our Sullivan Clinton protest, uh, programming. The chair of the boards that year was Walter Boots Kennedy um, from Allegheny. And according to the Buffalo Evening News, he stood up or said to the, um, state representatives, the six nations of the Iroquois did not feel that conditions warranted their participation in the Sullivan Clinton program. He said, this is because the white man has broken his part of the agreement. And he's speaking to Nelson, who is Flick's secretary, his des designate. And um, he goes on then to bring up a topic that's a little bit different. Now, Kennedy, um, had already testified at length at the Everett Commission years before, and he was described in the Cornell Daily Sun as a well-known orator and farmer. And his oratory skills received public recognition in the Buffalo Evening Two News. Um, but he brings up a different kind of complaint, one that was unassailable. And he says that at the end of the war, they reserved different pieces of land for themselves. And one was for the burial places of their fathers, their ancestors. And he outlines the different counties of concern. He lists precisely Chautauqua, Wyoming, Livingston, and so forth. He explained that the Indians had the solemn promise of George Washington himself, that these burial places would never be disturbed, um, that the white man would never molest the sleep of our fathers. And then he goes on to say that now, um, white men have thrown up the bones of our fathers and they're bleaching in the sun and the snow at, the, snow at this moment. And we understand that they send their collections of arrowheads and copper beads to the graves to your museum cases in Albany. Okay. And then according to the paper, an Onondaga man added that his people had plans to dig up white men's cemeteries and scatter the bones around unless this careless practice is stopped. And um, Andrew Gibson, who was also there, Apparently they all not in agreement. Um, the next day, this group of, of leaders passed a resolution unanimously condemning the desecration of Indian graves and they sent a copy to the New York State Legislature. Um, so I find it really interesting that, um, first of all, this is an early articulation or, of, of native views regarding disturbance of burials. And it's sort of an interesting side story. But also when invited to participate in parades and pageantry and marker dedications, um, most of the people contacted by mail responded with silence. But when finally forced into a public response at the closing powwow of the Cornell Indian Board's meeting on a totally different topic, the people present didn't bother to challenge the distasteful or boastful nature of the Sullivan and Clinton festivities. Instead, they used the occasion to raise a different topic of great concern. Okay. Now, uh, there is another possible reason for um, this rebuff. I'm already suggesting that um, non-participation might have been partly because the land claims um, case that was pending 
also related is the way the Sullivan story is told um, in the pageant and on the plaques. So let's look at the plaques. So the marker text says simply this, and it talks about an expedition about against the hostile Indian nations, which checked the aggressions of English on the frontiers, extending westward to the Dominion of the United States. Okay. This account suggests that Sullivan Clinton was the end of conflict with these hostile, so-called hostile Indian nations, check the aggressions. Also suggests that it's because of Sullivan Clinton directly that the Dominion of the United States was extended. It makes it seem that Sullivan Clinton made New York possible. The later marking out of different villages um, with the yellow and gold plaques also constructs a narrative of decline, and especially at a time when the trope of the vanishing Indian settler colonial fantasy was so pervasive. Um, this declension narrative has been in place for a while, um, as we've seen. The monument test, test, text also assists in promoting outright falsehoods. Because Haudenosaunee attacks after 1779 were more devastating than before. So Barbara Graymount has argued this. Um, people, um, Native Americans who took part in many of these attacks, Corn Planter and others have, have argued this. Um, so Gra Barbara Graymont says that Washington goals were to break the power of the Indian foe and make the frontier safe, but the expedition, in quotes, um, achieved neither of these goals. Instead, now the war became very personal. If they did not have a cause before, the Haudenosaunee now had one. Um, and then Six Nation members returned the next spring to many locations, as we've heard from Dr. Mount Pleasant and as her work documents. So, so it's suggest it's there's a lot of misinformation there with that first line. Um, historian Colin Calloway has recently calculated the number of houses and other things um, that were carried out after. So if you look at the bottom of this quote, he, he sort of tallies up after Sullivan and Clinton, after Haudenosaunee returned to different areas, they were able to um, mount even more attacks on the frontier settlements than before the Sullivan and Clinton raids. Um, so you can see the last, he said it, it generated more, not fewer raids on American settlers. Um, so that's the first two pieces of information. Then as we've seen from Dr. Mount Pleasant and others, um, New York was still Indian country, says Beth Ryan, who found that your American travelers in the Finger Lakes into the 19th century came across Native American on the roads everywhere. Um, so what happened? Well, the Haudenosaunee homelands were obtained through various means, but often by speculators or political leaders who were often one and the same after Sullivan and Clinton. Um, in one case, they were making dozens of land disposition agreements, um, often fraudulently without following the provisions of the 1790 federal treaties. Um, entrepreneurs and leading politicians openly conspired to obtain lands held by the Oneida and Cayugas, Omagas, and Senecas to benefit from the transportation rev revolutions. And Larry Hauptman and others have really documented this well. Um, so the markers promote a narrative of, of like so-called Iroquois, in quotes, decline, and this vanishing Indian fantasy um, that was so common of the time. And they also tell non-native New Yorkers that they owe their good fortune to Sullivan and Clinton. And so there's a lot of misinformation there. I want to just return finally to this question of timing. There's a synchronicity here that may not be a coincidence. So when I look at, at the timing of the land claims cases and the Sullivan Clinton extravaganza, there are a few points to make. These events took place at a time of great Haudenosaunee activism and a possibly earth shattering land claims case. Rather than seeing the Haudenosaunee responding to the state, we might want to reverse the kind of direction here and suggest that the state may be responding to the Haudenosaunee. We might see in the 1929 Sullivan Clinton events, a reaction to the lawsuit or an attempt to prevent future lawsuits See, this is really our land, the plaque seemed to be claiming. We really won this land fair and square. We won it in a military victory. 
you owe um, this land to Sullivan is what the plaques seem to be telling New Yorkers. These plaques would cause some misunderstanding in the state, even into the 70s. When land claims cases were heating up again, um, there was a public hearing about a Cayuga negotiation underway in 1979. And a Waterloo supervisor just kind of blurted out, well, I thought when Clinton and his troop smarts through here in the 1700s that the Indian problem was taken care of. So this suggests that the false story told on the plaques makes it seem as if the state exists due to Sullivan and that the local white and non-native peoples owe their good fortune to Sullivan and Clinton. And swept from view is decades of land swindles that state officials directed or condoned, which many high ranking state leaders directly profited from. So we might see the 1929 monuments as an elaborate response um, this patriotic fanfare, kind of a desperate attempt to claim land for the state, kind of acts of possession at a time when the titles were very much in question. So that's um, what I want to say today. So I'm trying to show that even the markers that are around us may have had a, a, a political agenda underlying them that we should take into account. And thank you very much. I'll stop screen sharing now. Thanks so much, Professor Smith. Yes, that was terrific. Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Jake Edwards, who will uh, help un us understand this much better. Jake. In English name, my name is Jake Edwards. My Indian name is Haiwagai. I'm of the Eel clan here at Onondaga. And the story that you've been hearing about Sullivan and Clinton campaign is true genocide. False reporting of true genocide. It's to persuade young Americans, colonizers, minds to make them feel comfortable in a land that does not belong to them. We're not looking for any kind of evictions or anything like that. We understand in all reality, we must now live peacefully together. But this campaign of genocide against my people, it's hard to listen to again. It's hard to listen to it from a non-Indigenous person's writings. Because our elders passed down from generations that witnessed it, tell it a different story. And I'll start off with some of those people that were in that militia, in that campaign, didn't even want to be there. Some of them people that were carrying out the orders did not want to do what they were instructed to do. We don't know that side of what would happen to them if they refused, but there was over 5,000 of these white guys coming through the forest, led by some drunken Indians as scouts. There's a lot of times you, you don't see this uh, written or talked about as far as uh, how much rum was involved with all of these decisions, whether it was the colonels, Sullivan himself, George Washington himself, all influenced with a mind twisting rum of alcohol in their decision making. That in itself right there starts off with there's gonna be no good decisions made under that influence. 
The people of the Longhouse, we always talk of the good mind. We've been terrorized, humiliated, raped, murdered, persecuted, persecuted all of that, all of that stuff. And you know, we still have gratitude for our forest, for our mother earth, for the plants. You hear about reestablishing gardens right away. When we hid as people from these invaders, our elders used to tell us exactly where they hid their hiding spots and what they had with them. And it was just like our creation story of the sky woman bringing down what she planted, the three sisters. When they took off running, they grabbed beans and corn and squash seeds and hid with them. Right over there, right over that hill. When our people hid from these invading people, soldiers they're called. We were running to the Cayugas, see if they can help. We got a runner come met us and told us the same thing is happening over there. It's a pandemic in Haudenosaunee territory. Pandemic of genocide. So when we hear about this Sullivan campaign, you hear about these people want to take bus tours and celebrate all this goodness of Sullivan's expedition for the American people. There's a whole bunch of American people that were against it. There's still some people to this day, Americans, who still would want to honor their forefathers' word of peace. And there's people of the Haudenosaunee that we don't, we don't give that up. We know that's a part of us. It's in us, it's in our DNA as peoples of the Haudenosaunee, that we maintain peace in the best way that we know how with what we have each and every day. Through wartime, we still carry down ceremony for the goodness of the plant life, the medicines, the animals that run about. We keep them in our minds and in our hearts. We keep the inst original instructions with us as we walk about, as we run and hide. We ran and hide from those guys. We ran and hid from boarding schools. You look at, we ran away from boarding schools too. My grandmother was helped away from a boarding school in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and brought back to Buffalo Creek. Went and settled over at, got some shelter at Tuscarora, not far, and then was transported back here to Onondaga. We, had, we talk about those treaties, Buffalo Creek Treaty, and there was a couple of them. We should be talking about the fairness of our survival as Unquehome people here, as indigenous people, Haudenosaunee people. We don't look for, oh, what's that word, commemorate, commemorative. We don't look for that kind of stuff that we survived. We feel it in our hearts and in our minds every day. And we give thanks. Then we go deal with some of the problems that were put to us. But we do that first with our connection to our Mother Earth and all that was given to us. 
Can we carry on? We can't leave them out because we're getting brutalized by America. We can't leave out the wildlife. They're getting brutalized too. There's comfort in knowing that to this day, they still carry on their duties. And to this day, so do we. They're not going anywhere. And we're not going anywhere. As long as we stay in, as one. We come together as one. In our goodness, in our thoughts, in our teachings, we pass on and we obtain more from the plant life. As long as we pay attention. So when you talk about the destructions, the mass destructions of the Sullivan Clinton campaign. It's a horrific thought. They hit real deep. But I give gratitude to my ancestors who helped us to be here today. We have this. Spot. I know where that hiding spot is. I'm not going to tell everybody, though. Might come back. So we took some youth up to that spot this past year to explain to them Sullivan's campaign. And it was around uh, the 4th of July. And by golly, I got to tell you, that's a scary thought when you hear all that celebration going on outside of us here. The fireworks, the big bangs, it just puts your mind into cannonballs and black powder guns coming after you on your own living room floor, the woodlands. As my grandmother was interpreting the oral teachings of her great grandmother who ran up alongside Onondaga Creek right out here and took off over that way. She tells us about that, what her great grandmother told her, what she did and where she hid. And my uncle, he showed me where it was. He said, take me for a ride, I'll show you where it is. So we went up there and he showed me, he didn't get out, he was too old to get out and walk them cliffs. Oh, here he is right here. This guy right here showed me. And to listen to these elder stories, to hear about the locusts and the message they brought us from the earth, a reminder to us at that starving time to have gratitude for what Mother Earth still provides for us. Through that hard time, to share gratitude is powerful, very powerful. It's not something you can read in a book, somebody's journal. In those oral teachings we hear, we're not to trust the white man and not to be with that person alone. You take always two and so that you can watch over that shoulder watch his back and you can watch over your shoulder and watch your back as you're talking to a guy who appears to be trustworthy and friendly like the dutch did to us what columbus's crew did everywhere they landed They have instructions from their church to subdue and enslave us. And they carried those teachings into the next centuries, into the next centuries. Oh, wait a minute, where are we now? 2020 in Washington down there is doing about the same thing today to the indigenous people looking for fresh drinking water on the southern border of what they call the United States. It's going on today. 
So one of our messages to the world is to understand truth in the history of America, understand truth in the survival of the indigenous people, and understand that you don't teach your children untruth because they grow up living in a world of untruth. And so we have to teach what's here. And when you look outside, first thing in the morning, what's here is the sun, the new day. And so you share gratitude for that, for seeing that. You see the forest and you hear the birds, even in the winter time, they're not just spring songbirds. You give gratitude for the snow and the rains and the thunder beings are carrying on their duties. America needs a strong lesson on honest teachings because what provides information is this mechanism of what they call education, higher education higher education. We know professors from all over the place teaching and some are teaching indigenous studies and learning. Everybody's always learning. It's a given. We're, we all are. We learn something every day or we should be. And so these uh, professors are coming back and telling us that these people don't know that we even exist. And it's kind of funny because our neighbors just down the road in the next town, they didn't know we lived, we were still here. They thought Indians were out West, Western Indians going by the John Wayne shows and all that stereotype of big headdress and colonizing effects of the modern Indian is portrayed by the newspapers and the articles. And so we have a lot of work to do and I'm glad to see this information getting out and not getting out as the truth of what happened. The Onondagas were never conquered. You cannot conquer a neutral nation peaceful nation, those are called massacres. Invasions and massacres, they document it as battles. They call them battles. Not a battle. You got families sleeping comfortably and you wipe them out. You just won a battle. Come on, let's teach the truth here and, and, and explain to America what genocide is and how America became what it became because of the teachings of the Haudenosaunee's visions and teachings of the great law of peace. And how do we conduct ourselves when we greet somebody? When we greet somebody, we don't know what they've been through. So we brush them down, clear their throat, wipe their eyes, clear their ears so they can hear. Then we sit and talk with them. So now they got clear voice from the dust in their travels, perhaps. We lift them up in their seats. We offer them a seat and lift them up. We clear off any of the stuff that they may be dealing with, a death in their family, a sickness in their family. Today, by golly, that pandemic going around is, 
There's a lot of clearings got to happen. And so we conduct our way ourselves in that way, and we still do. And we have a New York State Assembly at one time, I'm not sure of the year, but there was this fellow by the name of James Dwayne or Dwayne James. But he had two names for both of his front and last name. And he was either working for the State Assembly under George Clinton, or thereabouts after. And he suggested to the people of New York State to stop treating the Indians as if they're nations and stop accepting their rituals before a meeting. Don't let them conduct themselves with what we do and what we have been doing with the Ganohanyo, the Thanksgiving address, the words before all else, sometimes it's called that. And we would do that at every meeting with the people of New York, with the colonizers, wherever they were from, the people of Maryland, the people of Virginia. When you thought, when you heard earlier today about how far the influence of the Haudenosaunee went, you can look at where the maple tree grows, how far south, how far west, how far north, and also how far does the great white pine tree grow? That's the influence of how far we pass the message of peace on. So when you hear about Treaty of uh, Lancaster, say 1744, about land in Virginia, the treaty was here in Pennsylvania. We were the prime delegates besides the governors of well, Virginia and Maryland, they were giving us wampum to maintain peace as they were slowly encroaching. And some of our people didn't like it. And so they were saying that we violated the treaty in the mountains of Virginia. It wasn't that we violated the treaty, it was we were being encroached on and the people were stealing from us. And we sent them back to wherever they're supposed to be safe, Jamestown or these little towns down there. The, the history's not reporting all those thieveries that's been going on. And so we gotta maintain the facts of what these people are reporting in their history books. You know, you come up to 1924 and you talk about the land claims and Edward Everett and all that, it was good. Edward Everett came here to Onondaga and he explained that. And what he offered was after his explanation of this land is rightfully yours. He says, we can make it right and sell it properly. And the Onondaga people at that time told him, we already know that's our land. What you're telling us, we already know that. And it's still not for sale. So he wanted to, us to side with him and present it to a court to clarify title so that we could properly sell it to New York State, legally sell it. And we told him no. And so we moved on. And the other part of that you hear about, I think uh, Andrea mentioned about citizenship. In 1924, the US passed Citizenship Act for those who apply. Well, not too many people applied for to be citizens of the United States as far as indigenous peoples. And that's what it was directed at. And so, and I think it was 1925, they resubmitted that and passed it as a blanket that made all Indians citizens. So here at Onondaga, we drafted up and sent a letter to President Kelvin Coolidge and at that time and explained to them that who we are. 
this is who we are, this is who we remain to be. So it was a basically a, a thank you, but no thank you letter. We'll maintain our own citizenship. And some of the reasons of that was as we looked at the treaties and we heard that discussion earlier too about the treaties. I mean, we, we wouldn't participate in certain events of celebrating Sullivan. It's because we had land rights and we got treaties. We have reasons. But there were some of us that did go along with it because some of us are fresh out of boarding schools and their colonized teachings is telling them that in order for you to survive here, you have to have this type of education. You have to drop your pagan ways and move on this way. Well, you see them with their suits and ties on you now and the big top hats and so forth in that era. Everybody was leaning that way in order to fit in so we don't get brutalized again because our parents did get brutalized in school for speaking language. We know that story. We heard that story. We heard it from actual people, not somebody written. Our relatives, you can put your hands on a desk and they get smacked by a stick, yardstick. And worse. And that's right here, Onondaga County. Those are the regular schools. We don't want to get into the terribleness of the boarding schools. Then you hear about the white guys taking their side of the Americans and saying that, well, we gave you land. We, we give you health. We give you education. We give you everything you got. You give us hardship. We maintained our land. You can't give me what's already mine because we never gave you plenary power over us. We never gave our power for you to decide what happens to us over us. So now you look back at the United States and the New York State. New York States, United States is now formed. They're arguing with New York State tug of war, like paperwork. They're getting fierce to each other, these white guys are, because they're arguing who's Indians we are. New York State always claimed we're New York State's Indians. United States said we're, we own all the Indians, they're ours. These are arguments. Probably drunken arguments because every meetings they had, they, they had rum there with them. They got a lot of our people influenced to it. And that's a sad thing to use that as a weapon. Weapon of war. Chemical weapon. And so today, even as I was a youngster, you hear about that. Uh, Chemicals, we nickname hard cider chemicals. Because it has the effect of that. It changes your mind. They got nigu hadenios. They got nigu hadenios is your mind isn't, you got two different, your know, mind's not right under the influence. So you can't make good decisions. You can't make good decisions for your children for what's cooking on the fire, and burn it. They got Nigo Hadenios is alcohol, but the mind changer, that's how you translate it in English, the mind changer. And when you look at these treaty um, supplies sent by Washington or sent by Albany, depending on who's making the treaty, sent by the land speculators, the biggest commodity is rum. And one of the biggest commodities are rum. They knew the weapon to use. And our, our elders used to tell us that these treaties, these land talks and so forth was 
the guys that were sitting there, our people that were sitting there knew that can't be right. You have a white man come into the community and then he appoints 60 new leaders, 60 chiefs of one nation to sign off on land. And so these guys are all tipping up that rum, having a good old time. Oh, sure, I'll sign it. Yeah, I'm a chief though, I'll sign right here. And so they did that. Those are fraudulent chief, fraudulent transactions. Chiefs appointed by a white colonel. <laughs> That's kind of funny, really. <clears throat> but it's not because New York State stood by that. They stood by that to this day. They know they're fraudulent. Their actions, so why don't they tell it, tell the truth? So with re-educating the people throughout the web, we'll get some good-minded, good-hearted people to do that work for them and put that education in front of them. And they have to understand that you can't live by wrong actions and enforce wrong actions to teach the children. Because in our teachings, we always carry on that the decisions that you make today are to no way negatively affect seven generations coming. As individuals, we make that same, that rule applies to us too, not just government leaders, not just council, that applies to each and every one of us and the decisions that we make today should no way harm our future generations coming. And so when you look back and you, you put rum into all of this, you know you are right away, you're not going to make a good decision. You know that. It's hurtful to see this army tactics of genocide enforced by the U.S. Very, very hurtful. And to see that people that are still living in this racism and supremacy actions across just this little town, town of Onondaga, still got it here. Town of Lafayette, our neighbors all the way around us. Supremacy. Because of what they were taught. Just a real quick history of what they're taught is Santa Claus gonna come down that chimney and bring you gifts if you behave. What a lie. What a lie. And so the siblings become older. And the older sibling now tells the younger sibling, mommy and daddy buy those gifts. There's no Santa Claus. Oh, the little kid gets so heartbroken and crying. The older person gets whipped and punished for telling the truth. You just ruined your younger brother's Christmas by telling him that. So sometimes the truth hurts, but you know that child will never forget that growing up that there is no Santa Claus, no matter what the department store or the industry out there, corporations promote, there is no big fat man coming down your chimney. And you're also teaching the kids destruction because you go out into the forest and you chop down a tree, perfectly innocent tree, drag it in your house, Heat it up when it's not supposed to be heated up, decorate it and pollute it and contaminate and then throw it to the curb when you're done with Christmas. So this stuff reaches the environmental impact also. Look how many Christmas trees are cut down every single year. So there's people, environmentalists are changing that. Corporations are changing that. They're bringing in toxic materials that you can store in your attic when you don't need it. 
So there's a lot of teachings that have to be constructed in a manner of honesty. We're here together. We're not looking for a division. The people of the Haudenosaunee will carry that message of peace wherever. As long as our Mother Earth provides for us. She has her instructions. We have our original instructions. And in our hearts and in our minds, we maintain that balance with each other. We have a lot of obstacles blowing in the wind, but we maintain that balance as one. And so there's a term that we use in all our discussions is Skada and Didwa Wait Nunya, or Dietino Han, whatever we're talking about. We bundle up our thoughts as one, all in one bundle. And we give a great gratitude. No matter what it is, it's Mother Earth, it's the waters, it's the plants, it's the medicines. The stars, the moon, the sun, the animals, the birds, the four messengers above keep our thoughts in the right way and remind us. That's one of their responsibilities to remind us. Make good decision. Show gratitude. Even during hard times, you know, thank them for what they've done. Those people that are doing the genocide, you don't know, thank them. You don't know, put them on a pedestal. You don't know, make stone monuments of them. You do the right thing and remove all of those monuments and put the truth there. And the truth is put the indigenous peoples back at their home and allow it to be. So we gather our mind as one and we think that way. Whatever we put our minds to, we can accomplish. And so, you know, there's so much that has to be discussed. There was so much that's left out. We only have a short time in this day to work on about 200, 250 years, 500 years of wrongdoings, and we try to correct it in 20 minutes. This is just the start. And so we look forward to working with all to accomplish peace and contentment here on Mother Earth as we walk about. And so we bundle our thoughts, we gather our thoughts as one, and we give a gratitude for this day, for the nourishments that were provided for us, for the songbirds that carry on their duties and so forth, and that we will work together to make this place that we call home comfortable for anybody that comes in our woods. Here at Onondaga, we maintain our peace. We maintain kindness at going to the best that we can. Donato. Thank you, Jake. Thanks. Thanks to all of our panelists. This has been a very powerful event really in um, in my life and I hope for all of your lives as well. Um, there's so much to talk about and we hope this is a beginning rather than the end of something. So I wanted to, we're, we're a little over time but I wanted to take a few minutes uh, to share a few of the uh, comments um, and a question. So there have been several comments and I'll, and I'll send them to our uh, panelists for sure to consider. But um, the, there's one consistent um, 
question that's come up that I want to throw out to our panelists. Uh, and that is the fact that there's a lot of hoopla now being generated about the 250th anniversary of uh, the Declaration of Independence, 1776. So in six short years, uh, there's a lot of energy around this. And it's similar to what Professor Smith was telling us about in the early 1920s and how there was a lead up to the celebration of the Sullivan Clinton campaign. We're in a different, very different place right now. And the question is this, how might county historical societies work with indigenous historians, indigenous peoples to tell a more honest history during the commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the War of Independence. This is a big topic, obviously, but there's really the need for this to this collaboration. And I'll just mention that um, uh, Indigenous Values Initiative is one of those organizations, the organizations that hopes to help uh, facilitate this conversation, which is so long overdue. Jake, did you want to say something? Yes, be awesome. <laughs> be awesome. <laughs> but other comments from our other panelists? Anyone? How do we deal with this new commemoration looking forward? Um, this is Alyssa Mount Pleasant. I'll just say very briefly that um, the New York State historian Devin Lander has been convening meetings across New York State with various people who are involved with uh, planning for the 250th celebration. And there was a meeting that was convened at Ganondigan um, State Historic Site uh, over the summer that brought together um, people from uh, county um, historical societies from um, national historic sites, state historic sites, as well as Hodin, uh, as well as a number of Haudenosaunee people, and um, I was one of the people who was in attendance, as were um, as were a number of others. I think it's a really um, it was a welcome opportunity from my perspective to be involved in the early stages of these conversations, and I'm really excited also to hear that the Indigenous Values Initiative is um, interested in working in this. I think um, from my perspective personally, um, there's probably a lot of work to be done internally among Haudenosaunee people to figure out the best ways to move forward on this and to um, develop outreach strategies to work with county historical societies and others. Uh, it's always good to hear these questions from people who are listening and to know that people have tuned in um, from who are involved in historical societies work. Um, I'm really taking to heart um, everything that Jake Edwards said and um, particularly um, what he said about reaching out to Americans who want to uphold the promises of their forefathers and as with what Jake said, I hope that this is the beginning of conversations that will that will continue. Thank you. I could just say a few words. Should I say something now? Okay. Um, I was just going to follow up and say that in, in my, the presentation I gave, the state historian was kind of a villain, <laughs> but the new state historian Devin Lander will is is a completely different. Um, character and interested in working as uh, Dr. Mount Pleasant has just said. And so I would really um, second what she has to say about rethinking and doing things differently. I think it's gonna be done very differently this time. So, and I wanted to also um, thank everybody for their terrific presentations, but that's all I have to say. 
Well, thank you. Um, thank you all again. Um, that's really great to hear that there are these efforts going forward right now. Um, and um, I think maybe we, maybe we should think together about other panels because you know when we were rehearsing for this event, we were wondering, well, there's so much to talk about. So this goes in so many directions. Maybe we ought to think a little more strategically about other panels that could be utilized um, in the, you know, as a, as a kind of mechanism for helping facilitate these, these cross-cultural interactions, you know, uh, so that we can come with, a, come up with a more full and correct uh, version of our, our history and identity. Um, so very heartening to hear all that. I think, um, we should probably sign off soon because we told people that this was going to go two hours. But um, I just want to thank everyone again. Um, I want to thank uh, our presenters, um, Professor Alyssa Mount Pleasant, um, Andrea Smith, and Jake Edwards. Uh, and again, thank our sponsors from SU University, Syracuse University. So I, I just noted that Frick. Uh, was a European historian at Syracuse University. Yes. I was thinking, I thinking, well, we're, we probably have papers of Mr. Frick uh, somewhere. Um, a huge archive of his work. Yeah. Archive. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, this inspires graduate students to do other kinds of work in these in these materials. So again, thanks everyone, and um, we'll look forward to future. Uh, future collaborations and future conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.